I think the hoopla is great. I think it's a great way to end a football season. I think it's uh, we're just doggone lucky to be a part of, part of it. Up until 4:15, we will accord the Super Bowl the hype that uh, that it's earned. At 4:15, uh, either Ray Wershing or Jim Breach will put the ball on the tee, and at that point, the hype stops, and we treat it like a game, like a football game. <laughs> CBS had another winning week in the ratings department. CBS won every time period on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights to take the week with an average rating of 21.5. ABC was in second place with a rating showing of 19.6, and NBC well back in third, nearly five points out of second, as a matter of fact, at 14.8. Here's a rundown of the top ten shows. It was CBS in first place with Dallas. What else is new? In second place with 60 Minutes. Nothing new there. And in third with a Saturday night movie showing of Help Wanted Mail. ABC was in fourth place with Victims on the Monday night movie. Then it was CBS again in fifth with Magnum P.I. And in sixth place with the Dukes of Hazard. Three's Company put seventh place in ABC's column. And ABC got eighth spot with Too Close for Comfort. MASH was ninth for CBS. And Walt Disney rounded out the top ten for CBS with Tales of the Apple Dumpling Gang. NBC's best showing in the Nielsen charts was Facts of Life, which tied for 13th with Real People, another NBC show, and The Jeffersons on CBS. Hill Street Blues slipped a bit for NBC, down to 27th place, and the second showing of Fame on NBC wound up way down in 43rd out of 69 programs ranked. One of the season's big surprises in the ratings department was the PBS broadcast debut of Brideshead Revisited, which finished in the top five against network competition both in Los Angeles and New York. Those, of course, are overnight ratings for major markets, so we'll have to wait until next week to see how the show did in the national ratings across the country. <laughs> Coming up, we go behind the scenes for an exclusive look at the new Star Trek movie. Plus, a visit with Soupy Sales in New York, the old and the new. Folks, I hate losing, and this neat lady sitting next to me just beat me unmercifully about an hour ago in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball. <laughs> Sally Kellerman, of course, a fine actress, and she's joining us today as our special guest host for the rest of the week. We're glad to have you with us, but you better not, better not beat me in the rematch tomorrow. I'm well, warning you. Uh, well, Ron, it's lovely to be here. <coughs> I probably will be beating you. Okay, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> anyway, it is nice to be here following in the footsteps of Mark Harmon and Jane Kennedy. That was fun having them. I'm sure uh, I'm going to have a lot of fun on the show. Well, you're going to have a special amount of fun introducing this uh, next story, and for a good reason, because you are in it. Tell them about it. Oh, I love seeing things I'm in. I remember it well. It was back in 1966. I was 12. I was the guest star on the pilot of Star Trek. I had special magical powers. and Let me tell you, back then, we couldn't have guessed the power and popularity that Star Trek would achieve. If you're like millions of Trekkies across the galaxy, and you're waiting for Star Trek II, the movie. Well, you'll have to wait until June to see the movie, but you won't have to wait any longer for this exclusive behind-the-scenes look. Captain's log, stardate 7412.6. The impossible has happened. That was the feeling among the members of the original crew of the Starship Enterprise when they were reunited in 1979 in one of the most expensive movies ever made, over 10 years after their television series had been canceled. Never, never did we dream that uh, 10 years later we'd be back as a, what, 40 some odd million dollar film. And then a few years after that, uh, here we are, you know, in, in the uh, torpedo room of Star Trek II. Thank God, you know, that we were all there and back together again. And uh, to me, it's a family that should never be broken up. It fits like a glove, Captain. Like it or not, we're part of, of a legend. The destiny of that legend is now in the hands of two newcomers to Star Trek lore, executive producer Harve Bennett and director Nicholas Meyer, who quickly discovered the dedicated and vocal following enjoyed by Star Trek. More than interested, almost frantic about it. At a given point, due to pressure from fan people and what's the story going to be and what's this and what's that, you can understand that we were kind of being driven up the wall by uh, the volume of mail, by pressure tactics, by certain... Uh, people who, as I say, felt overpossessive about Star Trek. So we simply decided on a policy, and the policy uh, is closed set. 
Uh, it's not a stunt. It's not a gag. It's not a publicity gimmick. It is a protective way of letting us do our work and make the best possible movie we can make. And you can see the problems. Like the man who crossed an Idaho potato with a sponge. It tasted horrible, but it sure held a lot of gravy. I don't exactly know how that fits in, but I do know. <laughs> I don't think a bunch of people can sit around and say, I think this should happen. Because then you get a movie that comes out that looks like something stamped on office furniture. Opinion, Mr. Spock. Recommend we proceed, Captain. Despite the external influences, all systems are go on Star Trek II for a June release. And the feeling around the set is so positive, there's already talk of continuing the saga. Star Trek III is a possibility. I think it's a distinct possibility. Uh, I think we'd have to fail pretty badly and prove that nobody wanted to see Star Trek again not to be able to do Star Trek III. It's a little premature at this particular moment to decide exactly what the next, if any, Star Trek project should be about and who should be involved with it and in what capacity. I need a recommendation, Spock, not the vague warning. I am looking forward to discussing as soon as possible the next Star Trek motion picture and, and my involvement with it. Now I'm ready for anything. Maybe we'll be doing the geriatric Star Trek uh, 20 years from now. <laughs> Soupy sales is still making people feel good even after all these years. Robin Leach found that out the hard way recently in New York. What does the name Soupy Sales mean to you? Talent, funny, comical. I love you. Thank you. This is my sister Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> Soupy Sales is still up to his old tricks, and that's making people laugh. And it's something he's been doing ever since he first hit the air in the 1950s with his own television show. It survived in different forms into the 1960s, when it was pulled off the air after Soupy asked his young viewers to send in money. Money? Yes. Get out of the business. You're through. The show was revived with a similar format in 1978, only to be cancelled again after several months. But through it all, Soupy has remained true to keeping people happy. These two are real. The rest are chicklets. It cures everything, your laughter. It really does. It's great, you know. And you got to watch it, because it's no laughing matter. It's, it ain't easy being funny. <laughs> Has comedy changed over all the years? I don't think so. I think, basically, somebody once said there are, like, six or seven jokes, and all the other jokes come out of that. I, could, I think you could disagree with it. And I think people always want to laugh, because they, there's certainly enough tears in their life and enough sadness. And, uh, it, and uh, I just think that it's a thing that you know right away if you're a success or not making someone laugh you either have a sense of humor or you don't and and it's marvelous if you do because it, it, it certainly will help you through life it, it with through everything now soupy has a new comedy album and it brings back memories of doing the mouse and all those pie throwing days and no interview with soupy would be complete without a demonstration of his classic pie-throwing technique. Throwing a pie to do it right is a follow-through, much like throwing a baseball or a football. It's an overhand follow-through, that's it. And it really has to go, you know, else it doesn't mean anything. Usually, they'll just shove it, it just, you know, it's there and you can't see it, you know. And I'll show you what I mean. All the girls from Fairline High School here. Yes, okay. <laughs> All set to go? Now watch it. It slipped, Robin. Do I feel it? No, I want you to get yourself washed up. You're making a fool out of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> on tomorrow's show, we go on location with As the World Turns in Connecticut. In our spotlight today, Proof that show business really does have a soul, and it's usually attached to a shoe. An auction of celebrity footwear in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, has taken in $2,000 for a local library. A pair of silver and black sandals once owned by Sally Struthers got the highest bid, 700 bucks. At the other end of the scale, eight pairs of brogans belonged to Audrey Meadows went for $35. In between shoes and sneakers previously owned by such footloose stars as John Travolta, Brooke Shields, Ed Asner, Charlton Heston, danced into the hands of eager buyers. 
If the shoes fit, wear them. Also afoot are plans to make a TV movie called Charles and Diana, a royal love story. No firm casting for the ABC project as yet, but at least two columnists are now saying that Marie Osmond is being considered for the role of Princess Di. It's sure a good idea if that project's half as popular as the wedding was. They're bound to have a hit on their hands. <laughs> now, Sally, considering how roundly you beat Ron in basketball earlier today, Thank you've got to be a basketball fan, I would think. But, you know, basketball fan or no, there's one team around that would make a convert out of anybody. I know who you mean, Dixie. The Harlem Globetrotters are so entertaining. They're the only sports team to ever have its own TV show, and their enormous popularity reached new heights in Hollywood yesterday. The American love affair with the Harlem Globetrotters reached new heights yesterday in Hollywood. For their contributions to the television industry, the Globetrotters received their star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Oh, I'd like to say this is one of the highlights of my life here in Los Angeles and being a Harlem Globetrotter. And uh, I speak for all the Globetrotters. I'd like to say thanks to everybody and God bless you, and especially to the fans out there, you have made us. So thank you very much. Throughout the years, more than 500 players have worn the Trotter uniform. They're well known around the world for their unique brand of basketball comedy. From their inauspicious start in 1927 as a five-man traveling basketball team based in Chicago, the Harlem Globetrotters have grown to the point where they've played more than 15,000 games in 97 different countries. In my 26 years with the Harlem Globetrotters, I've had tea with Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. I've had caviar with the late Nikita Khrushchev. I've had private audiences with the late Pope Pius, the late Pope John, and the present first Pope Paul. I've had cocktails with Austin Wells and Marlon Brando. Now, I played roulette in Monte Carlo, and I even finished getting my suntan on the French Riviera. It isn't who they've seen and where they've played that makes the Globetrotters so well-loved. We're dedicated to making people happy, and we know what it takes. It takes a lot of extensive traveling and a lot of hard work, and once you become, become a Harlem Globetrotter, that keeps the adrenaline flowing. <laughs> First, you're a basketball player, then we'll teach you the fundamentals and routines and comedy routines. Well, special part is really is, uh, being an all-around basketball player first. just about does it for us this half hour just whizzed on by didn't it join us tomorrow for features on Hervé Villachez of Fantasy Island and musician Todd Rundgren and we'll also have a look at some amazing stunts by the cast of As the World Turns I hear that's a real cliffhanger it is a cliffhanger more about that tomorrow finally this note of nostalgia on the 30th anniversary of the start of the I Love Lucy show a record label called Star Merchants is releasing an album of great musical moments from the program who could forget such songs as Cuban Pete and Sally Sweet or Desi doing the immortal El Cumbanchero. There's even a chance to relive the magic of Babalu. We leave you now with a bit of the music and video of TV's comedy classic. Hi, I'm Cheryl Hansen, inviting you to join Paul Lindman and me for the Wednesday edition of PM Magazine. We'll be visiting the Mill End Fabric Store to bring you money-saving stories and ideas. So tune in Wednesday at 7.30, right here on Channel 8. Thank you.